strength confide our striving would be losing were not the right man on our side the man of God's own choosing the half who that may be Christ Jesus it is he Lord Sava of his name from age to age the same and he must win the battle and threaten to undo us. We will not fear, for God hath will his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness scream, we tremble not for Okay, so our next song is O Thou in Whose Presence, page 36, page 36. And we are in God's presence today, and it's so good to be with you. Page 36.
Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to the Northview Seventh-day Adventist Church. This has been a, a sad and shocking week, hasn't it? Um, for our friends, especially in Uvalde, Texas, the horrible events remind us that we certainly live in the last days, right? At the end of time. And it makes us want Jesus to come very soon, like nothing else. I wondered, you know, when I heard about this, I wondered, I wonder if there's a, I wonder if there's a Seventh Avenue church in that little town. So I went on the web and looked around, and, and there is a little small 30-member church. So, as I'm sure you did, um, as I was praying for these broken-hearted people, I. Um, I spent time praying for that little church to be a light in the community. You know, if we had something here, what kind of a light would we want to be, you know, if a, if a uh, tragedy took place around here? I think Jesus would want us to be his tender hands to reach out with healing and hope to people uh, who are hurting and suffering. How can anyone survive losing loved ones in this way except that they have hope, hope, hope in the resurrection. I'm, I, I, just, I, I couldn't handle it. I'm, I'm glad that I have an understanding of God's great love and compassion and that the great controversy theme that we are so privileged as Adventists to understand, the idea that there is a great war happening and it will end and that God will put a stop to all this and that justice will reign I look forward to that day coming soon. I'm glad we can be here as brothers and sisters to encourage and support, sing together, pray together, listen to the word. I'd like to wel warmly welcome our visitors. If you're looking for a church family, we would love to have you join us. If you'd like to learn how to become a member of this church congregation, talk to the pastor or one of us elders, and we'd be happy to, to explain how that works. Uh, a couple of items I want to mention before we move into our worship service. Uh, if you're visiting, please stay by for our fellowship meal. Everybody's welcome, as I jokingly say. If you're visiting, please stay. If you're a member, please stay. It's for everybody. <laughs> um, prayer meeting is Tuesday night at 6.30 here. Uh, I was handed an a item just a moment ago that there is a, a fundraising event Palisades Worthy Student Fund uh, that's taking place May 29 to 31. I haven't had time to really study this, but we will put one of these on the greeter's desk. So if you want to participate in that and learn more about that, uh, you can do that. Also notice that camp meeting is coming up, not this coming week, uh, and, but the following weekend at the Valley Church and I believe we are going to live stream here as well, so we'll still gather here. Or if you want to go over to the Valley Church, that would be fine. Would you um, turn in your hymnals to number 799? I just think this would be a good, you know, in times of uh, difficulties, we should turn to the Word of God. It's the first place we should look for hope and courage. And I was just thinking that this Psalm 37 would be appropriate for us to read as we move into our worship service. I'm going to read the light print. Please join me in reading the dark print. It's entitled, Do Not Worry. It says, uh, this is from the, the Jerusalem translation, 
Do not worry about the wicked. Do not envy those who do wrong. Quick as the grass, they wither, fading like the green in the field. Trust in Yahweh and do what is good. Make your home in the land and live in peace. Make Yahweh your only joy and he will give you what your heart desires. Commit your fate to Yahweh, trust in him, and he will act, making your virtue clear as the light, your integrity as bright as noon. Be quiet before Yahweh and wait patiently for him, not worrying about men who make their fortunes, about men who scheme to bring the poor and needy down. <clears throat> Enough of anger. Leave rage aside. Do not worry. Nothing but evil can come of it, for the wicked will be expelled, while those who hope in Yahweh shall have the land for their own. A little longer, and the wicked will be no more. Search his place well. He will not be there. But the humble shall have the land for their own to enjoy untroubled peace. Let's sing together and kneel as we sing 671 as we enter into God's presence. The Lord, as we pray, take our hearts and minds. Our loving Father in heaven, we just want to thank you and praise you for the Sabbath. We want to thank you for your love that is fresh and new and powerful today. We've sung our prayer. We want our hearts to be tuned to you today. We seek for your Holy Spirit to be poured upon us and upon your people around the world. Father, we're living in awesome times, and we need you, and we seek you with all of our heart and soul and strength today. In Jesus' name, amen. I ask you to stand as we sing our morning song for our service, page 264. I'm sorry, 265, breathe on me the breath of God. Breathe on me the breath of God. Please stand as we sing this together.
perfect love of thine eternity. You may be seated. Bible workers are a powerful force in our churches. You know, we've been blessed at Northview with Bible workers, several different Bible workers since our church was planted just a few years ago. Bible workers give Bible studies. But more than that, they shine brightest when they help train and work with the rest of us in our congregation in learning how to witness and give Bible studies. Some of you sitting here today were led to Jesus because of a Bible worker. Our offering focus today is on Upper Columbia Conference Bible workers, your gift which you can mark on your tithe envelope um, under conference-wide needs will help advance this special army of workers across our congregation, and across our conference and even in our own congregation. So let's pause and pray for God's blessing on our offering and tithes today. Lord, as we return tithes and give offerings, we just pray for a mighty blessing on the Bible worker ministry in our conference. I just pray that you will bless each worker to be a brilliant light and a powerful trainer for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. At this time, we'd like to invite the kids to come up for our children's story and get the baskets and take up the children's offering. So kids, come on forward. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. I have a picture here. Do you guys recognize this? What is that? Uh, a, wa a water fountain. This is a faucet. Do you, guys, do you guys have one of those in your house? Do you have one of those in your house? What comes out of a faucet? Uh, uh, I, I have one of my... I have a photo of my dad's car. It, it only has red on it. It doesn't, it doesn't have blue on it. No blue. But I think maybe the same thing comes out of your red faucet that comes out of mine. Water usually comes out of that, right? Except for, for two and a half weeks, the faucets in my house didn't have any water coming out of them. We had this big problem with our water cistern. And so we were without water for two and a half weeks. So even though we had faucets, no water came out of them. So it reminded me of a story in the Bible. 
when the Israelites went without any water. Do you guys know how many times the Israelites were without water? A couple times. Sarah, we talked about one this morning, I think, too. So this one was in the time of Elijah. And in the time of Elijah, the Israelites weren't following God very closely. They had a wicked king on the throne. His name was Ahab. And Ahab had built a temple of Baal right there in their town. And so the people were worshiping Baal instead of worshiping the true God. And so God told Elijah to go before the king and say, there will be no rain until you turn from your wicked ways and follow God, right? And so, but did, did Elijah go without water? What did he do? What did God do for him? Do you guys remember? God sent him to a little stream where he had water, and, a, and of all things, a raven fed him. Now, I don't know about you, but we have blackbirds that come to our garden and steal food. But in this case, the ravens actually fed Elijah. So um, they fed him, and he had water, and then when the brook went dry. God sent him to a little widow, and she had a son, and he asked her for a cup of water, and then he asked her for bread. And she said, this is my last, I don't even have any bread. All I have is a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. And and Elijah said, well, make me a piece of bread first, and then you will have enough bread for your family. And so that's what she did. She made, by faith, she made him some bread. And then what, what happened is God made it so that there was never a lack of flour or oil in her house, and they were able to survive the famine. And after two years, two long years without water, we only went two and a half weeks without water. He went for two long years without any water or rain. And God said, Elijah, go back to Ahab. And so Elijah went back to Ahab, and he said, meet me on Mount Carmel with all those prophets of Baal, and um, we'll see who the real God is. And so they said, okay, we're going to have two sacrifices. You can go in the morning, have a sacrifice, and then I'll go, and whoever sends fire, whichever God sends fire on the sacrifice, will know that it's the true God. So all morning... The prophets of Baal made, it, made an altar and they put a sacrifice on it and they danced around it and they called on their god Baal. And did he send any fire? No. All the way through noon and all the way into the evening he, they went and still no fire. And then Elijah said, okay, it's my turn. And so he built an altar and he put 12 stones, because that's what they were supposed to do, one stone for all the 12 tribes. And then he laid on it the wood, and he laid it on it the sacrifice. And then he did something different. He built a ditch around the altar, and he had them bring water and pour all over the altar. So much water that it filled the ditch around the altar. And then he prayed to his God, our God, and he says, Dear Lord, may, you, may all these people know that you are the real God and you're the one that sends the rain. And um, so what happened? The fire came down from heaven and it burnt up the sacrifice. It burnt up the wood. It burnt up even the stones and all the water that it was around the ditch. Did that show that who is the real God? Who is our real God? Jesus, that's right. And he's the one that sends the rain. So I pray that, why don't we have a closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much that you give us water, the living water, and that we pray that you would send your rains upon us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. scripture reading for today is Joel chapter 2 verses 23 and 24 and the real God is going to send rain. 
Joel 23 and 24. Twenty-three, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And verse 25. Okay. And verse 25. 24 now. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats... shall overflow with wine and oil. And now verse 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. May the Lord add a blessing to this word and thank you. This is our time in our service for sharing praises and prayer requests. We have deacons who have some microphones so you can take a chance to uh, briefly share uh, so that we can all take a chance to share. Uh, I wanted to read John 15, 7. It's nice to remind ourselves of scripture related to prayer before our prayer time. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. I like that. Let's take a moment to um, share our praises and prayer requests, and then we'll move into our worship prayer time. Well, I want to lift up Steve Wheeler again. He's getting a little better, little by little, still in the Spokane Veterans Home, hopes to get out Monday or Tuesday. And Larry Curtis called this morning. He had surgery on his one eye, and uh, it's doing better, actually. And he has the surgery on the other eye coming up on Wednesday. Would like our prayers and knows that our prayers have helped him. Good. So thank you for your prayers. Praise the Lord. All right. Mike. Well, graduation's coming up for our core students, and uh, they got finals this week, so we need to pray for that. Mm. I think they have to give a sermon or something. <laughs> And then we'll have them back, so we need to pray for Traveling Mercies, too, as they come home. What's the name of the program they're in again? CORE. CORE, that's right. Our CORE kid. When you're under 30, you're a kid, so <clears throat> our CORE kids. <laughs> Anybody else want to uh, briefly share? Oh, I'm sorry. Right here, up on the platform. Why don't you just step up to the mic, Wayne? Yeah, it's a unique opportunity for my wife and I to have both my son and my daughter here today, especially since she's going to be flying out to Sudan 1st of June. So pray for her, but uh, yeah, it's a real blessing to have my kids here. Praise the Lord. All right. Anybody else? My brother just has been having some health problems, him and his family, and so I pray that you keep that in your prayers. We will. Anybody else have family with health issues that you want us to remember to pray for? Yeah. All right. We have one more? Yep, right here. Um, I have a client that um, this last week lost her son uh, from cancer. And I don't know the family history from the past, but the other two children really don't have much to do with her. And she was not allowed to see her son before he passed um, because of their con controlling the whole situation. And she's just broken hearted. Um, she's a devout Catholic, and um, I just ask for prayers for her that God will comfort her and that healing will come about between her other children before she passes. She's, she'll be 90 years old this, mm. this year. 
Do you have a first, first name? Uh, first name is Lonnie. Lonnie. Let's pray for Lonnie. All right. Let's kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, how glad we are to worship a loving and kind God who is merciful and forgiving. We come before you in quietness and will wait patiently for you, Lord, because we love you and we trust you. Lord, you are righteous and we are sinful. You are pure and we are stained with guilt. And so we come seeking <coughs> the forgiveness of our sins. I pray that you will wash away all evil from our hearts and make us like Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the blessing of Sabbath, for the peace that we can experience on this day, even when we are surrounded by war and violence. Thank you for Jesus who gave his life and now intercedes for us in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. We are so grateful. But Lord, we have things on our hearts that are weighing us down. <coughs> and we want to bring them before you. We continue to pray for our friends and church members, fellow church members in the Ukraine. I pray for a holy wall of angels to surround your people and around your churches and school buildings. We just pray for this war to end soon. And our hearts are also breaking for our friends and fellow citizens in Uvalde, Texas. We grieve, we grieve with these parents that have suffered loss and grandparents and family members. I pray for comfort and peace to those who are suffering and hurting over the loss of loved ones. And we ask somehow that this tragedy will turn hearts to you. I want to pray for Steve Wheeler, his healing and recovery, for Larry Curtis. I want to pray for our core students who are soon to come back. Bless them as they wrap up their studies, and may they be um, brilliant lights in our community and wherever they go. I want to pray for um, those who are traveling, for Wayne's kids. I pray for those who have families, family members with health issues. I pray for those who are struggling spiritually and discouraged. I want to pray for those who have suffered losses, uh, for uh, Lonnie and the broken family, the hurting hearts. I just pray that she will find peace and comfort in you. And Lord, we especially pray for Pastor Wayne as he shares with us bread from heaven. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen.
mother even though you are a king. Oh, Thank you so much, Ron Dean and friend. I don't know that I've met you before, but welcome. Thank you for sharing your music. Our heart's desire is to worship the Lord. Um, this thing is blank. What do I do? <laughs> I'm looking to the pro. He's having to wake it up. It went to sleep longer than it should have. So, um, we all know the, the news this week, the tragedy of the 19 children who were murdered in Uvalde. They're elementary students, nine and 10 year olds, in the last week of school before summer break. And an 18 year old gunman came through the door and began shooting, killing something happened. Connection lost. I'm not, it's not responding. So American violence is really become not surprising. We've become used to it, but it still is shocking. On an average day in the United States, more than 35 people are murdered with a gun. No other affluent country in the world has a gun 
homicide rate as high as the United States. Consider the following chart. There we go. Here's gross to GDP per capita, 30,000, 60,000, 90,000, 120,000. Luxembourg is the highest GPD country. The United States is pretty high. There's only a few that are higher, Norway, Ireland, Switzerland. Luxembourg. But this is the number of gun homicides per million. Look where the United States stands. Far and above everybody else. As bad as that chart displays, it's really, it's worse than that. Because notice the date of that chart. Since 2019, since the pandemic, violence has escalated greatly. It also doesn't include accidental deaths and suicide by guns. Altogether, guns killed about 45,000 Americans last year. Is it working now? Thank you. We will see. OK. If I get this thing right, there we go. Jesus said, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. And so what were the days of Noah like? Here we go in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 11, that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent, notice this, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only what? Are we there yet? The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. The prophet Joel wrote one of the smallest books of the Old Testament. And even though his book is small, it's power-packed, Joel lived in times that were hard as well. Disaster struck Palestine, where the Israelites lived. An ominous black cloud descended upon the land, a cloud of dreaded locusts. In a matter of hours, every living green thing had been stripped bare. And God gave Joel a message. Using this locust plague as a small illustration of the massive destructions and judgments to come upon the world at the time of the end because of the corruption that is in the world. Notice what Joel says. In Joel 1, verses 1 to 4, the word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders, and give ear, you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children, and their children another generation, what the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten, what the swarming locusts have left, the crawling locusts have eaten. And what the crawling locusts left, the consuming locusts have eaten. So Joel uses this locust plague who destroyed the land as an illustration of sin that destroys our lives, that eats away at the very life in us. And he applies this to the day of the Lord at the end of time. He says also, going on in chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord 
is what? The word, that, or the, the phrase there, the day of the Lord is referring to the end of time. The day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Who can endure it? He asked that question. That question is also asked by John in the book of Revelation. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garment. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. The book of Revelation, as I said, asks that same question, who, who can endure it? And after describing the loss, uh, how they will call for the rocks and mountains to fall upon them, and hide them from the face of Jesus. When he comes in the cause of glory, he asks that haunting question. For the great day of his wrath has come, and what? Who is able to stand? Both Joel and Revelation give the same answer to this essential question. Revelation uses the symbol of the seal of the living God being placed upon the foreheads of those who are able to stand in the day of the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit that places God's seal upon us, upon our foreheads. Joel uses a different symbol. He uses the symbol of rain. And in Joel 2, verse 23, he says, Be glad, then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the what? The latter rain in the first month. Rain is a symbol of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon God's people. The early rain started when the Holy Spirit was poured out in the days of the apostles on the day of Pentecost. When, what an incredible day that was. Remember how many were baptized that day? 3,000 were baptized, converted in one day as a result of the Holy Spirit being poured out. Signs and wonders followed, were performed by uh, the apostles. Uh, miracles took place almost daily. People would line the streets just hoping that Peter would, would walk that way and a shadow would cross them and they would be healed. Miracles of healing. And <clears throat> that were incredible day for the church. The book of the uh, Acts of the Apostles comments about the early and the latter rain. It says, under the figure of the early and the latter rain that falls in eastern lands at seed time and harvest, the Hebrew prophets foretold the bestowal of spiritual grace in extraordinary measures upon God's church. You see, the early rains in Palestine were the rains in the fall of the year, starting in the fall of the year, where they would plant their wheat. We do that here, uh, the dry wheat farming, plant in the fall, the rains in the winter, in the fall and the winter, the water of the seeds, they begin to grow. The latter rain was in the spring of the year, about this time of the year, where the rain would bring the, the, the crop to maturity, ready for harvest. And so the outpouring of the Holy Spirit 
in the days of the apostles was the beginning of the early or former reign. And glorious was the result. The end of time, to the end of time, the presence of the Spirit is to abide with the church. But near the close of earth's harvest, a special bestowal of spiritual grace is promised to prepare the church for the coming of the Son of Man. This outpouring of the Spirit is likened to the falling of the latter rain. And it is for the added power that Christians are to send their petitions to the Lord of the harvest in the time of the latter rain. In response, in response to our prayer, the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain. He will cause to come down the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. Do you want the latter rain? Do you want the former rain upon you today? Do we need it? What is it all about? You see, there will be a time of revival and reformation that has never been seen in our world to this point. The day of Pentecost was only a faint example of what is yet to come. The book of Revelation describes it this way. In Revelation 18, verse 1, it says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having what? Great authority. The word there, authority, means power. Great power. And the earth was illuminated with his glory. It's talking about an incredible uh, revival and reformation. The gospel commission will conclude at the end time with great power. It's not going to whimper out. The great power is the power of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. The earth will be illuminated with his glory. This paints a picture of an incredible revival and reformation that has been unequaled since the time of the apostles. But are you aware that there will also be a false revival, a counterfeit revival just before the true revival takes place. Talking about this false revival at the end of time, which centers around a false or counterfeit system of worship, the book of Revelation shows how extensive it will be. He says in Revelation 13 and verse 8, all, how many? All who dwell on the earth will do what? Will worship. Will worship. There you got a false revival. Will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's not those who are true to God. Some may be tempted to wonder how any revival could be a bad thing. But talking about the power of this false counterfeit revival, the book of Revelation lets us know who is behind it all. He says in Revelation 16 and verse 14, for they are spirits of what? Spirits of demons. Performing what? Signs, which go out to the kings of the, of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Jesus also described this false revival in Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23. He says, Many will say to me in that day, it's the day of the Lord at the end, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in, in what? In your name. Cast out demons in your name. And done many what? Wonders. In your name. In other words, miracles taking place, healings taking place, many wonderful things miraculously happening. Then I will declare to them, what? I never knew you. Depart from me, 
you who practice lawlessness. Many signs and wonders will be performed. There will be miraculous healings and other miracles will take place. It will be so close to the true revival that even sincere Christians will be at risk of being deceived. Notice Revelation 13, verses 13 and 14. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs, those miracles, which was granted, he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. So this false revival will be characterized by two things. First of all, by worship. But that worship will be based on man's law, and not God's law. Secondly, it will be based an incredible display of miraculous working power, performing signs, wonders, and healing. The true revival will also be characterized by two things. First of all, it will be characterized by worship that is based on God as our creator. Notice Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Here's this, this true revival going to the world, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. Worship the creator. So, the true revival will be characterized by worship that is based upon God as our creator. It will also be dis a credible display of miraculous working power, performing signs, wonders, and healings. Even though the true and false revival will be very difficult to tell between. There will be one significant difference. One significant difference other than but connected to the difference between worshiping according to man's laws on the one hand and worshiping according to the law of our creator, on the other hand. To discover the difference, we need to return to the prophet Joel. Because Joel gives us that difference. Here it is, Joel 2 and verse 23. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain, what? faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The term former rain can be translated teacher of righteousness. And the term faithfully can be translated according to righteousness. So let's look at that verse with that in mind. For he has given you the teacher of righteousness according to what? According to righteousness. And he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain, the latter rain, in the first month. When God gave the former rain, or early rain, what was it? He was the teacher of righteousness, wasn't it? He was a teacher of righteousness. And when he gives the latter rain, what will it be? It'll be the teacher of righteousness. And how? According to righteousness. 
Whose righteousness? Christ's righteousness. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of what? Of righteousness. Remember that the rain is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And notice what the prophet Hosea had to say about it. He says, sow for yourself righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains, what? Righteousness on you. You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way. In the multitude of your mighty men, therefore, tumult shall arise among your people, and all your fortresses shall be plundered. Chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Come, let us return to the Lord. For he is torn, but he will heal us. He is stricken, but he will bind us what? He will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. When the Holy Spirit comes upon God's people, he will be characterized by spiritual healing a great revival and reformation. He will heal us of the destructive power of sin, the destructive power of selfishness and pride. Joel also speaks of this promise. In Joel 2, verse 25, he says, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. How many can identify with those years that the swarming locusts have eaten in your life. That sin has consumed. The promise is that God will restore. He will restore. If you don't get anything I've said so far, I want you to get what I'm saying now. What I've said so far is only an introduction. Now we come to the heart of the message. But don't worry, I'm not going to keep you here all day. I wish I could. This topic would, would uh, merit that. But here it is. The Holy Spirit is our teacher of righteousness. This is the essential difference between the true and the false revivals. You get that? That is the essential difference between the true and the false revivals at the end of time. It is through the Holy Spirit, the teacher of righteousness, that God will restore to you the years that sin, selfishness, and pride have consumed. This is an incredible promise. And I don't know about you, but I want those years restored in my life. When the latter rain is poured out, there's going to be power, miracle working power. But when the false revival takes place, there's going to be power, miracle working power. We need to not have our focus upon the power, the miracle working power of the latter rain. We need to have our eyes focused upon the power of the teacher of righteousness in our lives. That is the power of the Holy Spirit that he wants to work in our lives. This righteousness is Christ's righteousness that we receive by faith in his promises. 
We don't receive Christ's righteousness by making promises to God. But we receive Christ's righteousness by claiming and laying hold of Christ's promises to us. You notice the difference? It's not our promises to God, but it's accepting and laying hold of his promises to us. 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, And his divine power, talking about Christ's divine power, has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who calls us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. There's those promises that God has given to us. That through these, through his promises, you may be partakers of that divine nature, that divine power, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The primary work of the Holy Spirit is not to give us miracle working power, but is to teach righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. I urge you not to seek the miracle working power of the Holy Spirit. Just seek the Holy Spirit in your life. Because when the miracle working power uh, miracle working power without the righteousness of Christ spells the false revival. Jesus told us what the Holy Spirit will do when we open our hearts to him. In John 16, verses 8 to 15, he says, And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. Talking about the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more, and of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged and I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And when he tells you things to come, or, and he will tell you things to come, notice this last part. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said, that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So the question I want us to, to wrestle with as we close here today is how does the Holy Spirit take the life of Jesus? How does the Holy Spirit take the righteousness of Jesus and bring it into our lives on a daily basis, in a practical level? First of all, Christ's righteousness comes in two forms that are inseparably connected together. Um, the first is justification, the gift of forgiveness and counting us as if we had never sinned. Perfectly righteous, he covers, we're covered with the righteousness of Jesus. When God looks at us, he doesn't see our past. Instead, he sees the perfect life of Jesus. Therefore, we have a new status in life. We're God's child, accepted by him. It doesn't matter what others think of us. What really matters is what God thinks of us. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, verse 6 says, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us, what? He made us accepted in the beloved. Who's the beloved? Jesus. We have a new status. We can truly say, I used to be in bondage of sin, but now I'm a child of God. Just like the story of Joseph in the Old Testament, 
One moment, he was a prisoner in the dungeon of Egypt. And the next moment, he was the prime minister of Egypt. Next to Pharaoh only. He went from prisoner to royalty in a matter of minutes. And so it can happen to us. Jesus frees us from the prison of sin, from the prison of guilt, remorse, bitterness, anger, pain, and makes us a child of the king of the universe. Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6 also reiterates that. It says, from, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, to the ruler over the king, and, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, he has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's true if you believe it. It's true. Do you believe it? Believe the promises of God for you. Repent of your sins and turn to the living God and he will clothe you with Christ's righteousness. Believe and it is true. Do you want Christ's justifying righteousness today? I don't know about you, but I need it and I want it. This justifying righteousness, though, cannot be separated from the second form of Christ's righteousness. One of Christ's righteousness cannot be separated from the other form of Christ's righteousness. They're together. And the other form is sanctification. The gift of transforming power of the Holy Spirit, taking the life of Jesus, his perfect righteousness, and molding our lives molding our characters into the righteousness of Christ. So sanctification is work of the Holy Spirit, taking the righteousness of Jesus and bringing it into our thinking, bringing it into our, our uh, feelings, and bringing it into our actions, our thoughts, our feelings, and actions in our daily lives. Do you want that righteousness of Christ? How many want that righteousness of Christ in your life? Are you sure? I should have asked you that first before you raised your hand. Are you sure? Because it means that you cannot hang on to your past sins. It means that you cannot hang on to your worldly ways of thinking. It means that you cannot Cling to self. It means that you cannot depend upon your old ways of coping. It means that you cannot hang on to your feelings of hurt, anger, and bitterness. Can the righteousness of Christ be mixed with the things of the world? No. No. Are you sure you want the righteousness of Christ? Before I close, I want to make this practical for us today. How many of you have been treated as bad as Jesus was treated? He was arrested by a rough mob, and his only crime was healing the sick, raising the dead, and teaching the ways of love. All his friends and followers disowned him and denied his friendship. He was left to suffer alone. He was drug off to a fake trial with false accusations. He was verbally and physically abused so much that he could hardly be recognized. He was spit upon, slapped, mocked, whipped, until the blood flowed freely. He was condemned unjustly, unlawfully, yet he opened not his mouth in retaliation. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter 
As a sleep a sheep before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Instead of opening his mouth in retaliation, instead of opening his, his mouth in anger and hatred and bitterness, instead of defending himself and accusing his, uh, his abusers, he did something that you and I cannot do. When they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminal, one on the right hand and the other on the left, and then Jesus said, Father, what? Father, what? Father, forgive them. And then what did he say next? He gave them an excuse for they don't know what they do. Father, forgive them. They, they, they don't understand it. They don't understand what they're going on. And he divided his garments and cast lots. Folks, that is the righteousness of Jesus. That's a righteousness that you and I do not have. And neither is it a righteousness that we can, to, that we can produce no matter how hard or no matter how long we work at it. It cannot happen. It will not happen. It's the righteousness of Christ. His righteousness character. Jesus had no thoughts of bitterness against his abusers. He didn't sin in his thinking. He had no feelings against them. He didn't sin in his feelings. He had no action against them. Do you want that righteousness? Do you want the thoughts of Jesus? Do you want the feelings of Jesus? Do you want the actions of Jesus? Oh, I know what I'm doing. I'm touching where it hurts in all of us. We cannot produce that on ourselves. All we can do is pray earnestly that the teacher of righteousness, the Holy Spirit, will come upon us with his early and latter rain power he is the teacher of righteousness according to Christ's righteousness. He will restore the years that sin has consumed. He will bring to our lives the very thoughts, the very words, and the very actions of Jesus. And when this is our daily experience, then we will be sealed with the seal of the living God. When this is our daily goal, one question will be all absorbing. Who shall approach nearest the likeness of Christ? Who shall do most to win souls to righteousness? When this is the ambition of believers, contention is at an end. The prayer of Christ is answered. Do you want that in your life today? When this is our experience, the work of the gospel will be completed and Jesus will come. Revelation 10 verse 7 says, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. As he declared to his servants the prophets. What is that mystery? 
that will come to an end. It will be finished, and it's going to be finished soon. What is that mystery? Colossians 1.27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of, his, of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is what? Christ where? Christ in heaven? Christ on the cross? Christ living his life in us. That is the hope of glory. You cannot separate Christ from his righteousness. His Christ is living in you through the Holy Spirit. He brings his righteousness with him. Is this the experience that you want? How many want that experience today? He will restore the years that sin, selfishness, pride, bitterness have consumed. How many will join me in seeking the Holy Spirit, in seeking the teacher of righteousness to be our teacher of righteousness today, the righteousness of Christ? If you want to know how to be ready for what is soon to break upon this world, it is the righteousness of Christ. Let's close with our closing song, number 316, Live Out Thy Life Within Me. Praise the Lord for that beautiful message. As we sing our closing song, 316, this is a prayer, and let's take it seriously as we sing it. Will you stand with me as we close?
Father in heaven, we just want to thank you and praise you for your goodness to us. We want Jesus to live out his life within us. We cannot do that on our own. We seek the power, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We seek the teacher of righteousness to have control of our lives, to bring the things of Jesus into our lives today. We thank you. We praise you because you've promised to do so. In Jesus' name.